Our next speaker is Pauline Akimo. Um, and um, we're going to hear some, a story about domestication rice, which is fantastic. Looking forward to it. Thank you. All right. So um, we are moving away from talking about populations to using a very small number of seeds to actually do very big things. So um, my talk is uh, going to be about using, understanding the process of rice domestication. If we can use um, the information that we get from the, the, what we learn from Oriza Sativa, which is domesticated rice, and then use it to sort of try and domesticate wild rice to generate a new type of food or to diversify our food systems. So um, we all know rice, we've all had rice at one point or another, so rice is a massive, massively um, produced crop, and, and through, before rice became rice as we know it, it had really an attractive quality, so one of the things it had, it couldn't be able to retain its seeds, um, so that seed shattering, it had a prostrate uh, sort of structure, meaning that it wasn't actually uh, functioning at its full potential, and we had long horns, so for breeding purposes, that was really difficult. But through the process of domestication, we're able to have rice as we have it now, which is erect. It's, uh, it's got its seeds intact, it's got no horns, and, and it's got the color that we have and we see in rice right now. And so because rice is a model crop, so a lot of work has been done on rice, we are able to understand what genes are involved in the process of domestication. So for instance, uh, um, genes involved in shattering, uh, generation of non-shattering varieties of rice, genes involved in um, breaking of seed dormancy, we are able to understand genes that are involved in yield, and we're able to sort of uh, get to understand the networks that have been involved uh, throughout the process of domestication. But in as much as we have benefited from domestication, we have lost significant um, genetic diversity along the way because we have bred for uh, rice that actually is uh, of high value. And because of climate change and we need to feed an ever-growing population, we need to sort of come back and, and, and think about how we can tap into different sources of or novel alleles that we can be able then to transfer to our breeding platforms to be able to generate more um, efficient uh, rice varieties that are, would be rice of the future, if I might say. And so because of that, we need to look at different sources of rice varieties. And one of the places we're looking at is uh, looking at the Australian North and looking at the Australian wild rices. Why? Because this these rices have geographical advantage, and in that I mean they're grown very far from where rice is usually grown, so they have been able to maintain the gene pool, and so getting unique alleles from these uh, rices is, is more possible than not. And another thing is um, throughout the relationship or throughout evolution, we can see that the Australian wild rices uh, are sort of closely re related to cultivated rice. Uh, and they're diploid, which means that they would be a good source to look at in terms of looking for um, novel genes or genes that we would actually like to uh, transfer into the breeding systems. And so before we actually think about that, one of the things that we, we are trying to do is to sort of present Australian wild rice as a, a new source of food. And before we embark into using the technologies that we want to use, we need to ask ourselves, is, is Australian wild rice palatable? Are we going to do all this work? And then it doesn't taste as great as, as we think it does. All people will not actually embrace the rice. And so um, sensory work has been done on, on a few of the Australian wild rices. And I'd like to go back when I talk about Australian wild rices, I mean three varieties of wild rices that are grown up north of Australia. That's Australia, Australia, uh, Oriza australiensis, Oriza meridionalis, and Oriza rufipogun. And so um, an analysis, sensory analysis of these rices was done, and it was actually found out that um, they have a taste that could be comparable to um, commercial brown rice, which is good. So now we have a base where people can actually eat Australian wild rice, so what can we do with this rice? And so one of the things that we're looking at is looking at the starch properties of uh, the wild rice. And so this is a different presentation from what I had, but I'm going to talk about it. 
Um, so starch is actually a very big component of, of uh, rice. And so with the domesticated rice, we, we have uh, amylose and amylopectin ratio, which determines resistant starch. And why we want to look at resistant starch is because we re people are moving towards getting healthy rice. And so when we eat the rice, uh, we want rice that will break down slowly with a low GI index, um, a rice that will actually get us to a healthy place. And Australian wild rices have been shown to have um, a high amylose content, and the ratio between amylose and amylopectin is, is quite um, different from cultivated rice in that it has a low, Australian wild rice has low GI index. So what we want to do is transfer that knowledge that we have across to cultivated rice, and Newman is in, in the, um, the auditorium today, and his work is basically looking at the nutritional component of Australian wild rices in, 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 in a, co a confined uh, trial where we have the three Australian wild rices that I talk about, and, and in comparison with cultivated rice and see what are the starch, what is the protein, what are the, the nutritional components of these rices, and what is the difference between them. And he's going to use that information as well then to try and, and, and use a process called gene editing, which I'll talk about later, to, to sort of try and bring closer those traits into the cultivated rice so that we can have a healthier, if I must say, um, wild rice. And so another wild rice that we're looking at is Oriza australiensis. Um, and so why we're looking at this rice is because it's, it's known to have uh, um, resistance to really uh, bad pests like the leaf hopper. It's actually got high amylose content. It can grow in, in the beauty about it, it has a rhizome and it can grow in dry areas. So we know that rice loves water, grows in flooded areas, but this particular rice can grow in places where there's um, not too much water, which, which is a, a plus considering that we need to move to, uh, to growing crops in, in changing environments. And so for us to be able then to interrogate and to understand what genes and what the functions are, we need a really good genome. And so uh, Sabrina, who's, who's one of the colleagues in the group, has actually um, come up or assembled a very good genome uh, of the Australiensis, which now gives us a platform to start asking questions, what genes are involved, can we, can we use gene editing to sort of alter these genes to understand their functions and also to, to sort of inform the uh, rice breeding platforms as they are today. And so with that, with the genome that we have, we need to so start asking ourselves the questions of, can we actually edit Australian wild rice? Can we actually develop a tissue culture system for this wild rice? Because for gene editing to take place, you need a tissue culture uh, platform that is very consistent and robust. And so one of the genes that we're targeting with this uh, Australiensis is because it's a really tall, um, plant, we're looking at the gene that was really um, massive during gene revolution, which is the semi-dwarfism gene, and we'll just uh, put it in Australiensis and, and sort of try to generate um, a sort of shorter plant, but with high biomass and has the potential to be used in biofuels. And so uh, Sabrina has been able to come up with a tissue culture protocol from seed to seed that's been able to uh, show that we can actually uh, do gene editing and is in the process of generating plantlets from um, from this experiment. So the other thing is that, as I said earlier, we need a robust tissue culture protocol. We have one for Australia, uh, Orise Australiensis, but the other two uh, varieties that I talked about, we have a seed to seed and an end to end protocol for tissue culture, which is great. Now that gives us more platform to start uh, testing out with um, our CRISPR-Cas9 system. But the one thing that stops or, or prevents uh, us from doing all this is that this wild rice is, um, when they produce seed, the seed shatters and we have up to 100% uh, seed shattering, which means that we really barely have enough seed to do our research or have enough seed to sort of do the kind of work that we want to do. And so, because rice is a model crop, as I said, a lot of research has been done on it, and it's been discovered that there's a gene that is responsible for shattering, and this, there's only a SNP, a non-synonymous SNP in this gene that actually um, loss, causes a loss of function in shattering, and this is um, one, one of a, students in our group actually looked at that with the Australian wild rices and found out that ideally there's one SNP that we need to look at. And so we've generated a gene editing pipeline for that. And before we do that, we 
as again I said, we need to figure out if our plants can be gene edited. And one of the markers that's mostly used for gene editing, and, and, and just to give a background what gene ed editing is for the people that are here that are not um, in that field, it's a technology that is used to um, integrate uh, DNA into plants, either insertions or deletions, and it uses uh, a nuclease, which is called Cas9, and what happens is that you have your target sequence or your trait that you want to sort of uh, work on. What happens is the Cas9 recognizes your target sequence via a recognition site and gets into it, generates a double-stranded break. And so there's two ways in which the plant will repair. So it causes non-homologous end joining repair, which the plant repairs itself. But also, if you know the function of a gene and you want um, to, the plant to repair in that way, you actually use, it's called homologous uh, DNA repair, where you use the target or the gene that you want the plant to repair itself in accordance to, and it will repair with copying the gene that you wanted to repair in that same mechanism. So one of the markers that is used for uh, to test gene editing is uh, PDS, which is phytoin desaturase um, synthase, which is an enzyme that causes photo bleaching in your plant. So if you have your DNA break, it repairs itself, and you see an albino plant, you know that your plant can actually be gene edited. So we have been able to show that we can edit our plants, and we've been able to uh, generate a pipeline, as you can see with the uh, sort of photo bleached plants over there. We're able to uh, sort of get in, in uh, an insert um, uh, for base pair insertion in our sequence, which generated an early stop code and we could actually get um, our albino plants showing that ideally we can edit our plants. So one, we have a tissue culture protocol going, we can edit our plants, so what else can we do? And as I talked before, I said uh, one of the problems that we have is shattering and we can't have enough seed for plants. That is actually the first place where we're going to start is we need to actually get seed to be able to do this wild um, experiment of experiment of actually generating um, domesticated wild rice. And for that, we've been able to actually uh, target the gene, QSH1, that I talked about, generating the non-synonymous non um, SNP. And we've been able to generate uh, plants of Oriza, Oriza meridionalis, that's uh, the glass house stage. They're all um, ready to undergo molecular characterization. And what we have pr preliminary results show that we actually have a two, two base pair deletion in our plants, meaning that our, our gene, the gene that we are targeting uh, to be able to actually generate non shattering plants, we might be onto something here. We might actually um, be able to generate a, a plant that has, shows a phenotype of shattering, hence we have seed for that. But one of the things that we needed to also understand is how the process of domestication uh, took place. And again, the QSH1 gene, which is a shattering gene, is a major gene in, in domestication of rice. We were able to look at it and, and we realized that from papers, there was, it's tightly linked to a gene that the function is not known. So when we did a knockdown of this gene in our domesticated rice, what we found out is that we induced awning again. And, and because during the process of domestication, um, the rice owns were, were, were selected against, uh, we are speculating that this gene not only plays a role in shattering, but it also plays a role in own development. And so uh, we can see with our plants, is, with the NOCA plants, is that ideally we are understanding and we're learning more about the genes that were, were involved in domestication and putting new meaning into some of these genes and apart from actually affecting uh, own development, we can see that it ultimately affects the seed size and it ultimately affects um, the seed weight and, and, and growth. And so when we look at our wild type plants, which are the plants that are non-edited versus the ones that have the gene knockout, we can see that we actually are uh, the QSH1 gene that we think is, is, plays a vital role in shattering, plays a vital role in other things other than shattering. And so, Another thing is that we can look at our, our plants and, and, and see that they are chalky. there's a lot of chalkiness, which means that the starch synthase is actually being affected. And so we can actually say that a gene, again, plays a, might play a role in uh, starch synthesis. And it will be good to look at the, the, the experiments that we get when we knock out the, the pathways that are involved in starch biosynthesis in comparison with this and, and sort of learn and try to understand the process of domestication and how we go back to, to that and how we can use that information to, to um, enrich the wild rices that we have. 
So in summary, what, what, what the talk is about is we already have high quality genome sequences within our group that we help us to interrogate and understand uh, these processes and heavily lift to the rice breeding platform, some of the genes that play a role in, in, in yield and, and in value addition to, to crops. We all also have a, a robust tissue culture system, which is what is required for any gene editing, for most of gene editing actually to, um, to be successful. So we have, we have done that, we have ticked that box, and so we have shown that we can be able actually to gene edit our, our rices, which is, which is a big step, beautiful, and it opens up a whole pathway of the things that we can do with the different genes that we have to be able to understand um, some of these mechanisms. And so we are in the process of generating non-shattering varieties and hopefully we get a phenotype and that will, 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 be, will be a game changer because now we can be able then to test other domesticated genes and we can be able to uh, do away with the owns and do away with some of the, uh, play, play around with the plant height, the mass and, and sort of just produce a product at the end that will be a wild rice that is attractive, that is of high value and it's palatable. And, and can be adapted not only to the northern part of Australia, but to the rest of the world. Um, and so, thank you, and I'm open to questions. That was inspiring. That's what I would say, inspiring, fantastic. Any questions? Can I ask a question? Yeah. If they will let me. Um, could you, you know, you're talking about looking at how rice was domesticated and particular genes that were used, for example, dwarfism and so on. And I'm thinking um, some of those genes might have had unintended consequences, like, for example, on I don't know, other aspects of development. We heard about the long coleoptile and things like that. I mean, you could, you could sort of do what they did, but even smarter, because they were maybe not knowing the mechanisms. But now that you know the mechanism, you could, you could do it a little bit differently. For example, just make it shoot-regulated gibberellins dwarfism. Have you thought about that? Yeah, we have. We have. have. <laughs> That's right. right. <laughs> we have. We have thought about that. Um, but the, why we are starting with this gene is because when we look at rice, a lot has been done on rice, and and some of these things have been depicted, and they know what what they what the effects would be. So when we start with the semi-dwarfism, it's not that's where we end. We'll actually look at what are the unintended, even with the CRISPR, when we knock out a gene, there will be some unintended effects that we don't know. So those are things that we'll probably look at. And so the models that people are generating would actually be beneficial for that. We'll be able to take them through a model and see, okay, this is what will happen. So this gene would be the best to target and, and stuff like that. It's very exciting. Work, I think. Very, very exciting and a beautiful talk. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, oh you, you got another question? I thought we were just going to go with one, but sorry, Pauline, would you want to come back? We're going to ask another question. <laughs> Always good to see Coleoptile Link being thought of smarter. My question, I guess my comment was given the impact and the direct link to traits. What's your engagement like with the commercial breeders? And how are you facilitating the adoption or movement of those genetics into commercial breeding pipelines? That's a very good question. I'm not sure I'm, in, I'm the best person to answer, but I will try and answer. Um, at this point, we are just trying to see if we can actually domesticate a wild rice. But we have been talking and we've been having this discussion within the group of how we can be able now to start engaging met probably farmers groups and, and, and other industry partners as we are generating these products because we do not want to engage them towards the end. And so it's something that we are seriously thinking about and it's something that we've, we've, we've put much thought into it and would like to sort of get the players, the stakeholders involved at this stage so that when it comes to the commercialization aspect of it, we, we are ready to go once we get a product. Thanks.